uh, you know, born in church, and uh, I was born and brought up in Chaplin, and um, after I went to Yukon, I wandered for about 40 years, and then came back. And uh, I haven't always had this interest in history that I do now, but uh, when I came back to Chaplin, uh, something about it, when you get older, you kind of want to look back and figure out you know, where we came from and uh, why things are, are they way, where they are. Now, um, but I'm gonna dedicate this talk to my dad. Bernie Church, who was truly a historian, and uh, he was the town clerk for 52 years, and some of you may have remembered him. And uh, I just regret that I didn't have uh, some of the questions that I have now that I could ask him now, because he would know the answers. Fortunately, um, he did leave some evidence behind, and uh, one of them is that he, he was the, you've probably seen our map, which is for sale if you haven't gotten it, gotten one of these. This is uh, the way Chaplin was before 1850, and he collaborated with Sidney Chrysler to develop this for the 150th anniversary of the town. And he was the historian, developed all the information, and Sidney was the artist that put it together. Um, okay. I'm going to uh, not talk says the history of Chaplin. I'm just going to be talking about some of the physical features in town. Um, and even with that, this could be going on for hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're, we're passing a piece of paper out with pencil. And uh, we're going to have some pop quizzes as we go along, just to keep you awake. So this means there are no flat spots in Chaplin, right? <laughs> no flat spots. That's a good point. And that's why Chaplin really was one of the last towns to uh, get incorporated in Woodland County because it wasn't very uh, convenient to have a house and a farm because of all this rugged country that we, rugged country that we live in. But we're going to uh, address these uh, physical features. Quiz number one gets you in tune. We have uh, some prominent hills in town. You know, you know all about it. Um, when I came back to town, I came back as a runner and had a chance to uh, uh, test all these hills out. I don't do it much anymore, so I got an e-bike to compensate. Anyhow, these are the prominent hills, the ones that are over 600 feet. What I'm asking you is just uh, to write down what the tallest hill is in Chaplin. I'll give you uh, five seconds. Okay, the answer is... Clark Hill, Clark Hill, which is really part of uh, Bear Hill, but it's it's over uh, closer to Parish. Clark Hill is over. This is Tower Hill and Bear Hill. Here's Clark Hill right here. It's actually south of. Uh, So 
Charles Trump. No. Swamp Road. Cedar Swamp. Okay. Okay, where did these hills come from? We have to start out 500 million years ago to properly address this. In Dick's quiz number two, uh, where is Chaplin on this world Earth map? Is it A? Is this Chaplin here? A, B, C, D, or E? There is a correct answer. Well, that's a good that's a good choice. B would be a good second choice, but actually, the correct answer is D. We're actually 400, 500 million years ago. Chaplin was part of Africa, and uh, what happens is. These are, con these are called continental plates. Uh, the continents are riding on these plates and are continuously drifting around the world at a very high rate of a couple centimeters a year. But over millions of years, a couple centimeters becomes uh, thousands of miles. So what happened is, during the next 250 million years, the continents drifted and came together in one big, one big supercontinent uh, called Pangaea. This is 250 million years ago. And here's Chaplin up here, part of Africa, bumping up against the North American continent. And this was quite a collision that created a lot of havoc. It crunched the two continents. One continent was actually sliding under the other and then causing the North American continent to push up. And um, it was creating the hills. And more than hills, it created mountains. We had mountains in Chaplin that may have been over 30,000 feet, higher than the Himalayas. No. This is 250 million years ago. <laughs> so, in the last 250 million years, what's happened is erosion. Water. All been downhill. Everything is downhill from there. So these mountains have eroded down into our present day hills. So today, this is the one, oh, one thing I wanted to say is 250 million years ago, Chaplin was pretty close to the equator. So it was, a, even though the mountains showed some snow up there, just like the, uh, Alps and uh, Himalayans have, have uh, snow on their peaks. Chaplin had peaks with, with snow on them. Um, but uh, they slowly, uh, uh, was in the, being in the moderate climate, um, we had, uh, there were dinosaurs. Uh, it was a, a warm climate for a number of years. Well, gradually over that time, the, the plates started separating apart, and when they did, they left part of Africa uh, with the North American continent, and that was the eastern part of Connecticut. Not all of Connecticut, it was just the eastern part. And they can, uh, geologists can tell, because they, they look at uh, fossils, fossils in the rocks, and see 
some of the fossils we have here are unique to Africa. So that's conclusive proof that this is the way it went. Okay, another thing that is, was happening uh, was the ice age that affected the, the hill. And about, actually about two million years ago was the beginning of the last ice age. And since that time, sheets of ice came down because it was a much colder climate and um, th th there was less sun to evaporate and colder temperatures to create the ice. And here's an outline of Chaplin, uh, not Chaplin, but Connecticut, as the ice sh sheet came down. Uh, this is actually shown it on the retreat. There were several iterations of these ice uh, glaciers, not just one, but they, there were several of them. So they come down, they retreat, and then they come down again in the same ice age. Okay, when these uh, uh, glaciers came down, they were up to 1,500 feet thick right here. So twice as tall as any of our hills. So this is a lot of ice, a lot of weight, putting a lot of pressure on the Earth, and the actual uh, Earth crust went down, uh, was pushed down by maybe 150 feet. It, it's now mostly come, rebounded and it's almost back to where it was before the last uh, glacier. But when the glaciers came through, all this weight and all this pressure pushed on and was rubbing against our hills, tearing them apart, take, taking pieces of the hill with it, and this is depicted by these little black dots toward the bottom of the glacier. And it kind of smoothed everything out. There were also, uh, when the ice retreated, there would be rivers coming out from under the ice, uh, disturbing the soil, distributing, and uh, uh, cr actually creating dams and creating other water bodies. Um, and I'm not going to get into all the different kinds of water bodies, but it's basically uh, the glacier uh, had a big effect on the way the, our hills are today. And you know, when they completely left, they left a, a layer of soil behind, which is full of rocks. <laughs> okay, hill names. I know you all came to find out what, why the hills, are, why the names are that what they are. Unfortunately, I don't have too many answers for you about <laughs> questions. So hopefully, I'll inspire you to do some more research and maybe come up with some answers. But uh, anyhow, let's start out with Bear Hill. Bear Hill, B-E-A-R. That's what's on our map today. But if you look at the old map, B-A-R-E. So why, which is correct? Uh, I know I've been up on Bear Hill walking through the natural forest, or jogging through, and I've seen bear tracks there. So we do have bears coming through. So it could, maybe it's based on the bear, but the older maps said B-A-R-E. Uh, why was that? Because it was bear. There were, about 20% of our land in the 1800s, the middle 1800s, uh, was forested. The rest was open because we had lots of small farms and um, 
I have a personal story when my dad took my mother on their first date. They, he took, drove her up Bear Hill Road and parked up on top of the hill. And there was, it must have been like a lover's lane up there. You drive in there and she's waiting for him to make the move and he's like, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> There's the Chaplin Village. It was bare, so it, this is like night, up to, uh, this would have been in 1930s. Or there's an argument for Beer Hill. I'm, I'm told by good authority that during the, when we, we, what do they call it when you? Prohibition. Prohibition. During Prohibition, this is where you could get your beer. <laughs> it says milk here, but this is where you get your beer. Right? Right. There's the lady whose house where it was. This is the 1920s, during Prohibition. Okay, Pumpkin Hill. That must be obvious. There must have been a bunch of pumpkins on Pumpkin Hill, right? Anybody find a problem with that? Pumpkin, um, Back in the days when these hills were named, and the hills were named long before the roads were, um, you look on the old maps, there's no names of the roads. There's just the names of the hills. And in those days, you didn't have these big farms that would specialize in one crop, say pumpkins or squash or corn. They just were growing things that they could use themselves. So. It's kind of unlikely that there, there could have been big pumpkin crops up there, but um, there's no proof that that happened. So I don't, I called, uh, I contacted the Ashford Historic Society because that's primarily where Pumpkin Hill is and um, talked to a lot of the residents there and nobody had an answer. Somebody said, well, maybe it's the kind of shape of the hill. It's like a pumpkin ridges. But this is another mystery that's still unsolved. Tower Hill. This is, this is one. Um, I was born and raised on Tower Hill. We never thought so much about the name. Um, and if you look on my dad's map here, he well, take that back. He does, does say Tower Hill, but he doesn't say why it's Tower Hill. You assume that there would be a tower there, but there's no evidence of it. So far, we haven't found any evidence of any uh, tower. Could have been a tower. And then, even, I think it was last year, I was feeling really good. I was running up Tower Hill, and I'm looking ahead of me. There it is. Ah, tower. In the old days, it looked like a towering hill. So that's my guess. But. Okay, how about water features? Uh, we have rivers, brooks, ponds, and pools. What's missing here? No lakes in Chaplin. There might have been a lake, and we'll talk about that a little later. Natchaug River, that's our most famous water body. Um, it starts way up here in Eastbury at the confluence of the Bigelow Brook and the Still River, and comes down, diagonally crosses Chaplin, goes into the Mansfield Hollow, 
a lake is a source of the water supply for Willimantic. And um, it's, uh, it's pretty famous. People know about it. Where did Natchaw come from? It's an Indian name, right? And it's, um, it's a, the Nipmuc Indians who were in this area of uh, north of Chaplin. Uh, Natchaw is the Indian word for the land in between the confluence of two rivers or two streams. And those two streams are Bigelow Brook and Still River, which form Natchaw River. So this land up here is called Natchaw, and so that's how Natchaw got its name. That's one I know for sure. It actually had some other, other names and some old maps, but we know it as Natchaw. Sorry these photos didn't come out that well on the screen, but what are they doing here? They're dumping uh, trout into the river. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the, the best trout streams uh, in, in the state, and they get, it gets stocked every year. Right, Frank? Did you yeah. fish there? And there's, there's stretches of the stream where you can boat, canoe, and of course, kayaking. And here, here they are, this is winter time, crazy people kayaking down into the, down into Diana's pool here. And here is Diana's pool. Um, Probably the most uh, famous thing outside of Chaplin feature is Diane's Pool. Everybody knows Diane's Pool, where you can't swim, right? <laughs> <laughs> so where did Diana's Pool get its name? We have a choice. Diana was a jilted lover who jumped to her death or slipped and possibly slipped in her tears. <laughs> or the Diana family owned the pool in the 19th century and ran a concession there. Which one would you choose? I like number one. <laughs> it's so romantic. <laughs> but I did try to research if there was a Diana family, it should show up in the deeds. And there was nothing in the 19th century or 20th century, no Diana families that either was the uh, mortgager or the mortgagee or, or the grantor or the grantee in the chaplain records. So, Maybe so. the grandkids. <laughs> Maybe it was the sister or the mother's name. Or Could be. Diana. <laughs> I, I actually heard somebody said that this is really not Diana's pool. Diana's pool is further downstream by Ross Road. So there's some girth for some research here if somebody wants to do. Now, isn't the sign for Diana's pool have a capital D and a small T? Oh, <laughs> so that means... Sure, how to address that? Oh, I do have a picture of Diana in the pool. <laughs> oh, I guess that's the wrong Diana. <laughs> Stonehouse Brook. Uh, this is the other prominent stream in Chaplin. We have lots of brooks, but um, the Natchog is probably the biggest stream, and then um, Stonehouse Brook starts way up here in, uh, in Ashford, actually. There's 
two branches of uh, the brook, and one goes down. Um, and along these brooks, there's usually a lot of beaver ponds. And usually um, there's, there's several, if you look closely at the map, and uh, there's the east and the west branch that join. And down, before you get to Tower Hill Road, uh, it cuts a, a really beautiful gorge down through there. And then later on, uh, as it goes past near the, the elementary school, it cuts a deep gorge, and there was a mill down here. Both, um, there were lots of mills in the early 18th, in the 18th century, from 19th century uh, on Stonehouse Brook and Natchaw, and also a lot of our other brooks. If you had enough water and you had enough head, um, this is how they got their power before, say, 1870s. So the uh, Joshua's Trust recently was uh, given this property that goes on both sides of this. There's a, a mill down straight, right here there's a mill. And um, we're hoping that we're gonna have a nice trail running down through there, which is gonna be a beautiful sight. I never realized uh, how uh, beautiful it was uh, to look there. Okay, Stonehouse Brook, where did that get his name? Another mystery. Now, my dad, and his map said that Stonehouse, the Stonehouse is right here at the intersection of, uh, of North Bedlam and Davis Road. The problem is, it's several hundred yards from the brook. So, but what he did, when he put it on the map, he put it in quotation marks. So to me, it meant that this is folklore and it not, not be true. Um, I tried to, I tried to take a picture of what might have been the remains of that snow house. Maybe, maybe not. Darling Pond. Everybody know about Darling Pond? Right close by here on Garrison Field. Um, popular place to go fishing. Um, a couple of years ago I said, you know, Darling, who's Darling? There's no Darlings in town. Herman Darling. I, I, I had to do a lot of research on the deeds and found that Herman Darling came to Chaplin about 1912. And he came with his sister and another family from Long Island. And he purchased a thousand acre parcel tract that included Darling Pond, it included what much of today's Natchaw Forest, uh, went up right here, it, it included the, uh, a four acre parcel that, that we're sitting on today. Norman, uh, Herman Darling owned all of this. And he had, he was in the lumber business and, it, and there was a sawmill on the property and I originally thought, well, maybe he created the dam to have his sawmill. But this doesn't make sense because this is 1912. And that's just a little tiny brook and it would only run good for maybe a few months a year. So they, he probably had a steam engine uh, paper mill, I mean a uh, lumber, lumber mill. So um, then I 
ran across some information. There was a CCC camp in the Natchez Forest during the 1930s. The government was trying to put people to work, so they had a CC camp. And the CC camp, one of their projects was to build all the roads that, that we have now in that Charles Forest. And if you go over um, over by Darling Pond, you can see the trail that goes around the pond. You can see where it was bulldozed out. And this was probably done by the CCC. And the CCC uh, list of projects you can find on the internet, one of the projects said that they created Darling Pond. Well, this would have been the late 1930s. Uh, Darling had so long since left. He, he passed away in 1925, and they sold all his, they piecemealed all his property. Uh, another thing that Darling had was a store. He, he had a, a, a mill, a store, he had a farm. The farm was uh, basically at Linquist House. And he was uh, farm there. So it was quite an operation. And the store was actually right here. The store is the same as the old post office on Cliffy Burdick's store before that. And Darling's estate sold this four acre parcel to Cliff Clifford Burdick. And Clifford Burdick, it was at about the same time that they were doing the bypass, the highway, 198. 198 used to come right through town, but they were bypassing the town. And they started in 1928, and uh, that was about the year that Clifford Burdick got the store. So he moved it over to the highway. So he didn't have to go too far. But that's an interesting story. I'm not quite sure what Herman sold. You guys, anything? Something to add to your list. Yeah. It's on the list. Yeah. Afterwards, Clifford sold the land to the town of Kaplan for the school. Right. And I think that land, that Clifford Burke, the four acres probably extended over to where, across the highway where our DPW is now. Kaplan Lake. <laughs> this probably should have quotation marks. <laughs> Perhaps question mark. Was there a Chaplain Lake? I like to think there was. If you, um, if you go over to Garrison Field, it's nice and flat. Um, same way all the land around here is flat. If it's not flat, it's swampy. And um, I think that what happened was when the glacier retreated, it formed a dam here, which uh, created this lake, which was like three miles by three miles. And you can see the swamp land here and uh, more swamp up here. But um, this would have been, the dam would have been close to where England Road is, where the road is here on the hills come down. So uh, I need to have a geologist here to uh, prove my point. Right, the water moved very fast down through Diana's pool where the kayaking is. Chaplin Road. Um, when I was a teenager, I was actually on the town crew. So I got to work on all these roads. And in those days, um, 
the town was responsible for welfare. <coughs> and uh, I think I got my job because my dad was a town clerk. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, um, if, you, if, you couldn't, if, you, if you could work and you couldn't find a job, you went to work for the town crew. So we did everything by hand. We would, uh, instead of having a tractor and a uh, circle bar, we had signs. And where's the sign? And, and instead of uh, having a, a, a truck brushing off the uh, sand on the road, we did it by broom. <laughs> so that was, I, I got to know Chaplain Road and Another little story about Road, Singleton Road. Singleton Road, um, anyhow, Singleton Road, right here. There was only one house on Singleton Road, and it was a dirt road. And most of the town roads were dirt before the 1930s. The paving was available. But Chaplin was a poor town. The population was really low in the early 1900s. It only had about 400 residents. And uh, the state was starting to make state aid available to towns to improve their roads. But you had to match whatever the state gave you. And Chaplin's DPW uh, budget was only this is like 1929, it was only $8,000. So we just couldn't afford it. And so the roads were really in uh, tough shape. Uh, here's, here's the map of the roads. The interesting thing to me is that uh, the, the names of the roads on the old maps, they weren't there. And people knew Describe the road as the road to Phoenixville, or the road to Hampton, or the road to by the church house. That's that's the way they described it. And I and even if, if you if you've got some old mail, we have mail back to 1934 in our house. 1834. 1834. Yeah, 1834 um, is when the family moved to the farm up on Teller Hill. And so we have all that correspondence. And the addresses on the envelope are just like Morris Church, Chaplain, Connecticut. So um, there wasn't a name on the road. There wasn't, we didn't have numbers. I don't think it was till the fire department uh, was developed, so they needed numbers on the houses. And we first moved to Chaplin, which was about 50 years ago, um, our address was only one row of Chaplin Connection. So yours was only one row. Um, huh? In the 60 and 65 when we moved here, we didn't have a number. Yeah, and Chaplin I remember when I was a kid, this is the 1940s, 1950s, our address was RFD North Wyndham. So all our mail came from North Wyndham, but there was no number, no street name. So the postman had to know where your house was. <laughs> so anyhow, um, at some point, they, they had to name the roads. And one of the interesting things, well, before I get into that, this is a quick history. The early roads um, were Native American trails. They were just like paths. Uh, the Native Americans didn't have horse and cart. They didn't have um, horses. Um, they would pull things behind them. And they were just little paths. And, they had, and Chaplin, there was no uh, Indian settlement in Chaplin, per se. But the, the Indians had to go up and down the river. They must have loved the fishing on the Chosa River, and they would grow pumpkins and squashes in different places. And the interesting thing was that they had to keep moving their crops, had to keep moving their little settlements. Why was that? 
Yeah. No, exactly. They had no cow manure or horse manure, so when they depleted it, they, uh, the nutrients in the soil, they had to move on to the next stage. But early on, there was, uh, as the other settlements, like older, older towns like Mansfield, uh, Ashford, Hampton, and Wyndham surrounding us, they would be roads leading to the different towns. But these roads, uh, the early roads, were very poor, and they weren't maintained. Uh, there was no DPW in the, in the 1980s. So how did they maintain the roads? If you lived on the road, you were taxed by one day or two days a year, you had to put in labor or bring your horses and, uh, uh, and drag it to uh, clear the brush. And so the roads were really in tough shape. And it was a big issue, the road maintenance. <laughs> Why it took him three hours to get to church. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? Your wife, Ben Chaplin, uh, uh, it took him three hours to get to church in, in Mansfield Center because the roads were really tough shape. And especially in this, like in the spring. Um, okay. A little, we'll digress a little bit. A little trivia. We do have 54 roads in town. Uh, only two streets, five lanes, uh, two drives, one bypass, one extension. And um, so that totals up to 36 miles. I got this from our DPW people. And only 1.5 miles in gravel. But before 1930, it was probably um, mostly gravel roads. Except for, we did have the two state highways, and they were uh, either macadam or asphalt. And that's the part of the one I did was called the cement highway, that was some of the 1922, called the cement highway. Right, right, concrete. Um, they, when they improved in, I think it took them like three or four years for the state to get the bypass, especially through this swamp, the old lake. Um, and th I believe they got a lot of the gravel from from Hubbard Pond back of us. Why did that roll the snow in winter on the? I have no evidence. I suspect that they did. They had to to be aware. If you had a lot of snow, um, some of the farmers must have had a, a roller or something. And, and if you did some work for the town, or the town. Um, Hey, look at it. Look in the old uh, town uh, budget. You will see how they paid people to do different things. A lot of it's not very specific, um, but I know in tough years they would have to. There would have to be a way of get. It wasn't like you had to get to a hospital because it wasn't. You know, if you were sick, you stayed home. Uh, but you had to. Get to church. <laughs> okay. Warren? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Bethel Road is a really strange name for a road. And Sinesky Magazine, probably 30 years ago, published a little article that uh, we cut out in the spring saying that, that there used to be a community right at Bethel Four Corners, a bunch of houses. They had their own little community school. And the problem was these families were always feuding with one another. And they used to call that the, the federal area because they were always just at, at war with one another. And I think that's how the name stuck for that for the Federal Road. There you go. <laughs> Bedlam Road, history of family squabbling. <laughs> and Bedlam comes from there's a uh, insane asylum in, in England called Bedlam, famous, and that's why they called it Bedlam. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, who 
Bluejack Road. Bluejack Road goes off of Tower Hill. And um, it always, Bluejack Road supposedly was part of the main drag between Mansfield Center and Ashford Center. And it's now most, it's our biggest dirt road right now. But you go down there and you can see some structures that indicate it was a more important road at one point. But Blue Jack, Joe Blue Jack came to town in the early part of the 20th century, part of the immigration of European farmers that came and took over ab abandoned farms and restored them, got them back into action. So Joe came and um, it's where some of you may know Jack Collins used to be. Um, he's, well, the Langars live on Blue Jack Road. But uh, Jack Collins uh, was a selectman in town. Anyhow, he bought it from, bought the farm from um, Joe Blue, Blue Jack. And he talked to Joe, because, uh, you know, his, uh, I wondered why it was called Blue Jack, because it was an old road. And Blue Jack came in the 20th century, so what, why was that? Well, it was probably because he didn't name the road. And this is during the Depression. The um, US uh, Coast and Geodetic, Geodetic Survey was doing uh, a study the, during the Depression, putting people to work, um, looking at the different elevations, measuring the elevations. And they went by Joe's house, and they knocked on the door, and they were on Blue Jack Road, and they said, what's the name of this road? And he says, well, it doesn't have a name. And he says, well, I guess it's Blue Jack Road. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that just tells me that, you know, a lot of these side roads just didn't have names until well into the 20th century. Uh, a lot of times, most of them are, are named after the residents who lived there. Um, Singleton Road. I didn't tell you the story about Singleton Road when I was working on Singleton Road as a teenager. There was only one house, and it was the Singletons' house. And they were the last uh, Native Americans in town. And they lived in the one old house that's still standing there, beautiful old case. And um, we were upgrading it. This is like maybe 1955, they said. It was a dirt road, and we were, we were upgrading the road, putting culverts and catch basins and stuff in. And I was a young guy on the crew, and the rest of them would stand around giving me orders. <laughs> And Earl Beelich, anybody remember Earl yeah. Beelich? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Earl Beelich, uh, if you take a look at Town Hall and you see Earl Beelich's photo up there. He was a large man, and he was just large. And, but he was a jack of all trades. He was also, um, he was also the guy who went to get a permit. But anyhow, and he would do the work. And uh, anyhow, he was he was a stone mason on this project, and Earl would go down into the catch basin, and he would say, "Go get that rock." It was a big rock. He barely fit in there. Into <laughs> so then, I learned to uh, crack the rocks, get a nice face on it, and then get, roll it over to Earl, and then he would place it in there. But uh, I think, Joy, Joy, you have a story about Earl. Uh, yes, I do about Earl Beal. I don't know if you can all hear me, but he, he was a, a great man. And, and Warren said a jack of all trades. Um, back in those days, I had such a dogged wall, and it was inside the house. Oh, <laughs> 
Okay, here's another quiz. Name at least two roads that must go out of town to drive to them. Yeah. You got 10 seconds. You can consult with your spouse. Okay, there are actually uh, three. Parish Hill Road, where our school is. You gotta get either go through Hampton or Scotland to get there. Um, Nollet Road on the other end of town and um, on the northwest part, you have to either go through Mansfield or Ashford to get there. And Bates Road is in by North Women. Gonna go through Mansfield or Wyndham. Anybody get the, all three? <laughs> Keep track of your score, because you may the winner may get a prize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we talked about that. Okay, Miller Road quiz. Miller Road is, is, is off of North Bear Hill, where the Golden Circle sits. But uh, was it named after Alva Miller, who was a popular first selectman in the 1940s? Or Judah Beck, who lived on the road and was the Miller at the cider mill on the road? What do you think? B. How many say B? How many don't know? <laughs> Actually, your B is correct. I'm not sure. Far back. This was. This was. Um, Greeny. Greeny. What year was that house built? When was 1981. It? So it would have been long before Clara Barracks was yeah. alive. So it, it could have been related, but I don't know. And, and the answer is uh, due to back, and this is, this is their house, and Marini was not. One of the older houses in, in town. So what were the changes between 1922 and 2022? How did the town evolve in terms of the structures there? The dirt road, most of the town, <coughs> Most of the dirt roads became paved. Um, we had modern drainage systems put in, solve a lot of those problems. Um, ponds and streams remain mostly the same, although if you have a beaver pond, beavers abandon their ponds, so the beaver ponds tend to move a little bit. On the other hand, people tend to um, augment the beaver dam and make it stay, you know, such as at Garland Pond. Uh, hills, uh, hills are gonna remain pretty much the same um, over these years, although we know Bear Hill, the Bear Hill, that they do change in appearance, but the basic hill structure, is little bit by little bit eroding away, we're not going to notice anything in a hundred years. Maybe in a million years we will. Yeah. 
Chaplin Rose 100 years from now? I, I think we'll still have the same Rose that we have today, pretty much. But there's going to be a lot of changes. Uh, we can only postulate you know, what might happen. You're going to have electric cars. You're going to have self-charging roads. You're going to have a lot of, um, you're going to have driverless cars. Um, you're going to have um, roads that are going to have, some people postulate, and there have been some that have been built, um, roads that um, have solar panels. They're made of solar panels. In Europe, there's some of that today. And once that happens, can make them so that you're not, not going to have any ice on them. Uh, you're going to have uh, communications between the road and the driver telling you if there's going to be an accident and all this kind of stuff. I think that probably is a little far-fetched for our back roads, but <laughs> certainly on the state highways, this may be happening. <coughs> Hills and the water features, uh, I think we talked about that. Uh, we talked about uh, the glaciers. The next ice age is postulated for not till 100,000 years. Uh, especially now with global warming, that's been pushed up, they used to say 50 to 80,000 years. Um, the next Pangea, continents are moving together. Again, it will start to move together again. Another, uh, it's not going to be for another 250 million years before they actually collide again and make new mountains. Uh, will Bear Hill change the Bear Hill? Let's hope not. <laughs> um, water features, climate change has a lot to do with our water features. We have bigger storms, drip it out our pond, can change, change that in one storm. Uh, so, but, and will we still have the beaver to make our pond? Let's hope that the beaver's still around. Yes? The, a book I read was saying that uh, they would find beaver teeth that were big. Maybe we'll get bigger beavers back, huh? <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all I have to say. So, any questions? We'll take it. Yes. Village Street, and I really enjoyed living on Village Street. And then all of a sudden, it was no longer Village Street. There they you put go. up a sign, and it became Chaplin Street, which is far less appropriate because <laughs> I, I don't know. And I never knew who decided that, and who, who did it, why. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs>
one day and there was a lot of cool water and ice uh, under the snow. And these men refused 